I love it when artists who've been doing it for a long time continue to do it for a couple of reasons. It's if you're not vital, what is the point? And that's not just for artists. That's for all of us, every human being listening. You need that vitality more than anything. And also the distance you have from the thing that made you famous in the first place allows you to look back at the thing that made you famous in the first place with a very thoughtful and meaningful approach. That is the case for Linkin Park. They continue to make records. They continue to reach an audience. And it's 20 years since Hybrid 3, which is wild to think about. We got Mike Shinoda from Linkin Park on with us right now. There's a lot of ground to cover with you, man. It's been a long time since we saw each other, and I'm, I'm nice. I'm happy to see you again here. But first of all, I mean, how are you doing? I'm good, man. Things are things are fine. They're like, you know, it's like uh, quarantine and stuff's not ideal, but but uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm. I feel like we're we're doing better than just surviving around here. Right. That's not. So, <laughs> that's a good place to be, right? <laughs> yeah. Things. I don't know if you remember, but. Um, all in that early days, all that much music uh, in Canada. I was the guy doing all those interviews with you in those shows. Much music. Yeah, I was the oh guy that God. that always interviewed you. You completely bailed us out. You were on that Metallic Olympus get big tour, and we did that mm. huge street uh, uh, television broadcast that night. And mm. Fred refused. So I was interviewing you on stage, and there's thousands of kids out there, and Fred refused to get off the tour bus. And you and your guys stayed an extra 40 minutes to fill time with me on the air before Metallica showed up. And it was one of the lifesaver moments ever on television and that, and you guys were so cool. And you had to roll up to Boston the next night. Dude, we were, I mean, if you think about it, like that was a great deal for us. We are like, oh, we get to like be in front of fans and like these guys are going to give us this opportunity to like just be around and talk about the band and talk about stuff. Like, great, let's do that. For sure. And I still have clips of this interview. You, uh, me, and Chester in an elevator at much just before Hybrid came out. Awesome. When you and I first talked before Hybrid Theory came out, I guess we weren't thinking about what would 20 years be later. Like, yeah, right. You know. Yeah, we. I mean, we were always, like, um, career-oriented with it. Like, we always wanted to do things in, the term, in terms of, like, will will we be proud of this or happy with this in five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know? I mean, we thought about those things, right? but um, you can never guess what's going to happen. The the package, like, what? so we talk about this 20th anniversary edition and what people are going to get, what they have. The packages, so the physical package is so sick, man. I mean, it's like, it's huge, first wow. of all. It's got an 80-page book with all of these photos and um, stories and stuff that, you know, just reminiscing and, and stuff that people haven't ever seen. Like actually this, so the beginning of this making this thing was so like, I wasn't into it in the beginning when it got pitched to us at, at, with ma management, like kind of explain this idea that they had been talking about with the label. And I was like, really like 20 years, like, I don't know, like why now? Mm -hmm. And what could we offer that fans would be like really into and once the photos, like once some of the photos and I don't know if you can see yeah, any of this stuff, but, but like some of these old photos from old shows and the very beginning, like these are all flyers from the first two months the band existed. Wow. Like it's, there's some great stuff. And then those are from my archives, but everybody was pitching in stuff. And I was like, you know what? This is going to be pretty great, I think. And, and eventually... Uh, we pulled together like two of the things I think are the, are the, the coolest things in here are um, a bunch of demos that no one's ever heard. All right, we're hanging with Mike Shinoda here on Apple Music Kids. Let's get a little microdose of one of the demo versions of In the End. Starts with one. Multiplies till you can taste the sun. And burn by the sky, you try to take it from. But if it falls, there's no place to run. Crumbling down, it's so unreal. They're dealing you in to determine your end. And sending you back again to places you've been. And bending your will till it breaks you within. And still they fill their eyes. With the twilight through the skylight. And the highlights on a frame of steel. See the bright of your likeness as I write this on a pad with the way I feel it is screaming in my dreaming as it seeming that you played your part like you're heartless take apart this in the darkness but I know that I've tried so hard and got so far Fought for me, calling me to be part of their 
property And now I see that I get no chance I get no break Fakes and snakes quickly lead to mistakes And as the tightrope within slowly starts to thin I can only hope that they close their eyes To the twilight, to the skylight And the highlights on a frame of steel See the brightness of your likeness As I write this on a pad to the way I feel Hear the screaming in my dreaming As a seeming that you played your part Like you're heartless, take apart this in the darkness a bunch of songs that we wrote at the time both with our original singer Mark I should say wrote and recorded uh, both with our original singer Mark and with Chester there are songs in here that people have never heard before until right. now so and those by the way those are available on Apple Music and all streaming services um, so you can just go listen to the songs but the, with the box that you get the CDs and, and also a DVD of um, like a, basically a documentary from that time as well so all this footage we found a hard drive full of like video footage of stuff from that time. And this is before smartphones. Like it wasn't <laughs> like we could just pull out a phone and film stuff. It's like you had to have like a, like a videographer, like a camcorder or something. You just have to like think about that stuff. And we, and at some point we did. That is the voice of Mike Shinoda from Lincoln Park. We're hanging out today talking about the, well, lots of things, life and such, but also this uh, release of hybrid theory, the anniversary release. Let's get into one of those tracks with Mark singing. Here's dilate. Crack the bulletproof vest on an MC's chest. Yes, yes, to make you sweat like a full core press. On a quest to show my flow's control. The movement of a mass of bodies at a hip hop show. From high to low, fill the audio rain as the blood in your veins. Pump to this rhythm while the beat maintains a subterrestrial status. King of the lyrical amplifying apparatus. Space is violated. The heat of my mind makes my pupils dilate. Don't test this, or you see wreck from the bestest. Check this tape deck, weapon pumps, thumps to your chest. This is make your neck feel it happen. As I'm rapping, you can feel your every bone snapping. You deserve it, feel the force of my fire. Cut me loose, get live like telephone wire. Try ya, style against me, the can G. Try your best, no less. Just then you will see my top notch spot, the middle block, gold medal. Can G heaven sent represent the next level? Well done, it's just something. Oh, my God, my nigga's well done, it's just something. Oh, my God, my nigga's well done, it's just something. Oh, my God, my nigga's well done, it's just something. Oh, my God, my nigga's well done, it's just something. Oh, my God, my nigga
You know, but it's one thing to, I mean, go from recording on four tracks and you and your friends trying to make songs. And then there's this alchemy that has to happen. You know, I think the transition from your voice to Chester's unbelievable voice as well. And then all of a sudden there was mm. this thing that was happening where the songs were there. When did you get a sense that what would ultimately be hybrid theory could be something that reaches people? Brad and I had this really interesting conversation when we were, it was probably around like 98, where we were discussing like how we had this push and pull of things that we liked that were niche, that were that didn't have big fan bases, and then things that we liked that did. Because Brad, I think it might have started because Brad was a pop listener in addition to being a metal listener. So he he liked more more. I didn't have any pop pop songs in my like collection, yeah. and he'd have like Britney Spears in his collection. Like not at the time, but that was the idea. Like he liked a good pop song too. We both loved Depeche Mode, for example, in between, right? But he would listen to a straight up, like, I don't know what, New Kids on the Block. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and, the, and, and then we arrived at this philo philosophical, um, in a sense, it wasn't a mission statement, was, but it was part of our identity as an early incarnation of the band that if you've got a good idea, isn't it a waste of the idea if nobody hears it, right? Mm -hmm. Like the whole point of having a good idea and feeling conviction about the thing that you made is to not only to scream it from the rooftops, but earlier in the process to design it in a way that it reaches as much as many people as possible. So you could, for example, you could make something, you could have an idea for a great song and then skin it in something that's avant-garde and dark and off-putting. And then it doesn't matter how loud you scream it from the rooftops. The thing you've made is off-putting to people intentionally. So our idea was like, okay, we can, from the ground up, from like the sounds we use and the way we record them and everything, we can find, we should find a, a really good balance of, pushing the boundaries like making people a little uncomfortable but also like meeting them in the middle in terms of sound and and we to go back to your earlier question part of that was most of the so rap rock was starting at the time right. and groups like like corn and limp biscuit and um and other ones that were more rap like there's a group called snot there was head pe there was all these bands that were right were in that lane um and almost all of them were really macho, sometimes misogynistic to a point of being ex excluding other groups and I, like, it was like, some of it was like really sexist. It was homophobic. Too. It was, uh, yeah, it was just yeah. the worst. It's yeah. the worst part of the male psyche was existing in a lot of that music. Right. And some of it was masked or almost like, um, it, 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 there was an excuse built in that these people were in a lot of cases had gone through really difficult stuff in life. So like they, and they put that stuff on record, but the way they coped with it and the way they presented it was through the lens of anger and macho violence. Um, and the shows were that way too. We didn't grow up that way. And so when we made our stuff, every one of us had this feeling and it was led by me and Mark in the beginning. And then me and Chester, um, after that transition, but it, it, the introspective side was so important to us because it was missing. It wasn't a, it wasn't a point of differentiation between us and say kid rock. Like that wasn't the point. Mm -hmm. The point was like, this is who we are as people. And like, this is, um, how we like to, we're not scared to express ourselves in that way on a record. And that's fact. That's the reason why the, the album cover became what it was. Like the soldier represented the hard and heavy aggressive side of the record. And the wings represented the softer, more introspective side. Was this from your family? Was this from your, like, what do you think was a reason why you and Mark and then you and Chester and the whole band, I mean, like Phoenix is highly educated and where you just decided we're not, 
that's just not who we are. Like not a lot of bands were standing up. I like just that. thought we just thought it was the right thing to do, man. I mean, it was just like like yeah. It was the, I'd say the tougher part for us was the other side of it where I remember we went to um a show I'm not I'm not going to call anybody out, but we went to we did a show in the south on our very first tour. And what had been happening was we were the band was starting to we hadn't released one step closer yet. We were personally packing boxes of promotional material. So we'd print a thousand stickers and we'd put them in FedEx boxes and ship them out to fans with the, the, the cassette sampler and t-shirt or whatever we could send. Mm -hmm. And we were just trying to promote. And then the first time we got out there, there were already fans. We were like, oh my God, like we've got 20 fans. We've never been to the city before. We got 20 fans here. We got 40 fans here. Like that's crazy. Um, tells you how like little the internet had developed at that point. Right. So we get to some of these shows and I remember the moment when I met a fan who in conversation, we were just talking about what else they were listening to and about their town, like, you know, about them and the culture and the music and whatever. And he dropped the N bomb. And I was like, mm -hmm. there was a huge, there was a really long beat. And I don't remember who else from my, from the band was there. It was cer I certainly wasn't the only one, but you could feel us both calculating. Do we say anything right now? Do we correct this kid right now? Who is like we want fans? But we don't want that kind of fan. Mm -hmm. And I, I, and I know that we both just like like I think we both just gave him a look and like like acknowledged that that was not cool, but we didn't say it. And we were really torn about that later. Right. And I think that that I like moments like that were ones that we got we went like as we got bigger, we went, you know what? There there is a trade off like. Yeah, you want to build your band and yeah, you want but you not but at like at what expense, you know, so at a certain point, mm -hmm. you have to decide that you're not going to that that there are ways that gaining new fans is not appropriate. Like that's the kind of fan I, I would, I would be happy to have that fan on board as long as I can talk to them about that thing that they did that made me feel like really uncomfortable and we can have that conversation. So I know those conversations would come up in different ways after that. Right. No, well, look, and you're not, a, you know this, you're not a white guy. So you grew up in a city that even though it, uh, it is multicultural LA, it is still very segregated in many respects. And there are lots sure. of race problems there. So you would have experienced that, I'm sure, in your life. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, you know, with all of the Black Lives Matter stuff going on all over the place, um, all over the world, we, we, in LA, we have a very specific cultural, um, like, part in that conversation or version of that conversation. And as a person who's like, I, I, I think I read more like from a police port or like a, a, a person who doesn't know me. I usually read more Latino. Yeah. <laughs> like they use people who come up to me and speak Spanish. Um, and I'm like, I don't, from a police perspective, Spanish. that's for a police perspective. I am probably Latino. Yeah. Um, even though I'm half Japanese. Um, but yeah, I think, I think anybody, I mean, I don't want to go on too long about that or go too deep on that. The the point is like, if you're, if you're, I can also be like white passing. I can be brown passing. Like it's a, I'm a weird, I'm just, I always called myself like a mutt. Like yeah. you don't know what it is. Um, and yet at the same time, like I don't think anybody has dealt with the kind of racism and the kind of, you know, systemic uh, oppression that, that black people have in America. So with that said, like, I just want to count, I just want to say like, yes, we've, you know, I've dealt with racist stuff and at the hands of cops yeah. and stuff like that, but not anything compared no, to not like, at all. my black friends had dealt with like they dealt with much worse I cannot take this anymore saying everything I said before all these words they make no sense I found this in ignorance less I hear the less you say You'll find that out anyway Just like before Everything you say to me So the one step closer to the edge And I'm about to break I need a little room to pray Cause I'm one step closer to the edge I'm about to break I expect the answers, I'm so clear 
wish I could find a way to disappear All these thoughts, they make no sense I found bliss in ignorance Nothing seems to go away Over and over again Just like before Everything you say to me Just be one step closer to the edge And I'm about to break I need a little room to breathe Cause I'm one step closer to the edge And I'm about to break Everything you say to me Just be one step closer to the edge And I'm about to break I need a little room to breathe Cause I'm one step closer to the edge And I'm about to Break back and and look at i mean look it's, it's, it's been a few years now since the passing of chester but grief is its own thing and takes its mm. takes its time how how, how yeah. are you and how are the guys dealing with all this because it's not just you've lost a friend this is also part of your band this is a thing and so the public knows you all together in a lot of respects yeah it's more like it's more like losing a, 
a brother or a best friend who, because we spent, not only did we spend an insane amount of time together, but also we built something that, like when, when, if you think for the average person, like if you think about your um, introducing yourself to somebody else, mm -hmm. a lot of times that goes in tandem with like, what do you do for a living? What they're asking is like, who are you? Right. And part of that is like, what do you do or what do you, what are you passionate about? And we built that together and we were, so that's identity stuff. That's like, who are you? I am Lincoln Park. Right. And so Lincoln Park being part of all of our DNA, when that got, when that got, you know, fractured and taken apart in, the, in a sense, the, um, the, I don't think anybody could really understand because you can't relate that to anything else. It's not family. It's not friends. It's not brotherhood. It's not business. It's all of those things wrapped together. And it's really like in the, in a negative sense, it's like a meshed, you know what that term means? Like a therapist would call that like a meshed mm -hmm. behavior. Um, and for better or worse, like, y you know, that could be something, uh, that is not very healthy, but you also can't do it any other way. It's, it's, it's in order to be a band and be successful on that level and exist for this many years as like a functional, a highly functional unit of guys, like we, it had to be that way. So, um, yeah, with that, with that said, like, I think that there are parts of our relationships and our like well being that we're doing so like, I'm super proud of everybody and how everybody's, doing and done and, and, and like coped with things and adapted and also parts where it's like, yeah, we could probably do better. <laughs> right. It's like, you, you know, just whether it's like just having bad days or like, um, I don't know. We're all human beings though. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Like, I don't, I, I'm sorry. I know that's a little bit of a cagey answer, but it's also a very personal subject. Yeah, so yeah. It, it, I, I don't think any of us, are at liberty or would even be capable of explaining it to anybody. Like we couldn't even, you couldn't even get a therapist <laughs> and be like, okay, so here's what I feel or here's what's going on or whatever. Like you could, you could spend years on it and still not like crack the surface of what the, the meaning of all that emotional information is. I feel and like I think maybe I think I listen, I feel you. And I think that part of the challenge of our, of our, of how we are all raised and conditioned is that we are expected to have answers for things and things are supposed to have finite conclusions. And that's just not how the human condition works in my mind. It, the things just move. And it's yeah, well, I think that's actually, I mean, maybe this gets really too philosophical, but with the amount of information, so I read this, I, I always talk about this great book that I read uh, called um, the paradox of choice. And it's about having too much choice. Right. And what you what yeah. how that feels and why it exists and what you can do about it um, and what you can't. And um, we everybody, everybody the way society is now, you've got so much choice with every little thing from like, what socks do I buy yeah. to big choices about your life? Right. Um, and that's Th and, that, and so the author of that book, Barry Schwartz, I had lunch with him and we and we talked a lot about that. And he was he wasn't making it up. Like this was really impactful on his life. And I think jeans were really what threw him off. <laughs> jeans was, that was the thing that set off the, that was the reason he wrote the book is because he was trying to buy a pair of jeans and he found himself look, looking at, he went in, he, 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 one day, one day he went to the store and there were three pairs of jeans to choose from. And then and a few years later he went to the store and there were 25 pairs of jeans. And he was like, yeah. he spent hours there looking at the jeans and trying everything on and chose a pair, bought it, left, and realize that every store now has 25 pairs of jeans. And he's like, oh no, did I make the wrong decision? Should I have gone into the other stores? And he's like, why am I being so overwhelmed by this thing? Here's the thing. I think all of us are dealing with a version of that on a, on a deeper level now. Because it doesn't matter whether it's your clothes or your music, your education, your job, your news that you watch. There's way, there's, now there's like options on the truth. Like you can choose a truth to believe and that's not, that's not accurate. That's not cool. <laughs> True. The whole point of truth is that there should be a truth. Like yeah, gravity yeah. exists. You're going to tell me gravity. Someone's going to say no gravity right. actually doesn't. Dude, there are people who sell lots of records who are telling people the earth is flat. Yeah. Right. And, so and flat uh, earth is an example <laughs> of, 
that used to not be an option. And now somebody's <laughs> saying, no, actually, I think that's an option. It's like, you know what? If you want to go, go over there and believe something, if you want to be contrarian and believe something that is the opposite of the truth so that you can create an option out of something that's not really an option, that's your problem. Yeah. What I was going to say, though, is with all this optionality, with all these, there's an infinite amount of options and information and too many things for us to take in. And I think one of our problems, like one of my problems and the thing that I talk with my friends about sometimes is that because there's too much information and it's impossible to know everything and it's impossible to even wrap your head around some things that you're interested in, it, what we tend to do is we tend to oversimplify mm -hmm. and some things are okay to get the Cliff's Notes version on. Like if I decide not to watch Tiger King, and you give me the cliff notes, oh, well, it's about this. And now I can laugh at the memes. Mm -hmm. Like, that's perfectly fine, right? But there are other things that it's like, when you start to simplify it too much, it does lose the essence of the thing you're talking about. You can't do cliff notes version of, like, your morals and your, like, mm -hmm. it, it, like emotional things, things that relate to emotional intelligence, like, you know, your um, mental health or I mean, even stuff that you're super interested in in music, like yeah. just a very practical thing. Like I wouldn't like go on YouTube for 25 minutes and then call and study a guitar and say, yeah, yeah I'm a, I'm a guitar player now. Like there are certain things that require you to go deep. Right. And so we should like, I think the point is like, I, I, I say this to people because I, I say like, don't feel bad about that. Like, don't feel bad about not knowing things, about changing your mind about things. We always beat up on, you know, entertainers and politicians for changing their minds. Right. But that's actually a sign of like being thoughtful and like having, you're being a human. Like, oh, I, I thought one thing and then I learned things. And now I feel different. It goes back to you and Chester with this idea you can't oversimplify your grief or explain it or it's not an easy <laughs> yes. thing, right? It's just, you've got to... I realized that's where we started. Thanks for reining it in. Yeah, Thanks for reining true, me right? in. I went off the deep end for a second. Riding with the head full of buckets of red. It's what it says, still stuck in my head. It's a bread, thoroughly bled. It led to the land that it never come back. Smaller than a thumbtack and it never run from that. Thumb planet to size, also over the horizon. Smaller than a fly sand of a lyrical land. The power of a god in my cynical hand with the pan once again. Swimming in the center of the hit or the mist. Reeling in my thoughts, getting lost in the mist. Realize the one that the size of the fist and the killer of the killer with a flick of the wrist. Now I'm living in another place no one can say I live for them. Still see it's not meant to be for me. I wanna be in the energy that would be enemy a place for my head. And the second is gone, the weapon of time is stronger than a nuclear bomb. Eternity a half life, something that math can't write, you can't fight nor flee. Still be around if it wasn't for me. Wait that versus whatever my friends you see the attraction of the payback. Don't want me to say that. Play back the thing now, getting lost in the chaos, tossing ink down, singing the thing to myself. Electric neck twitch, hungry for a head full of hectic set this to the temple to beyond time. Added to the panic of my confine. Singing the thing to myself, electric neck twitch, hungry for a head full of hectic set this to the temple to beyond time. Added to the panic of my confine.
I care about the world and I care about people for I, I, for whatever reason, but I'm grateful that music was encouraged me to be the version of me that I wanted to be, right? I don't want my entertainers to make me stupider or more dangerous. I wanted them to make right. me a, a lovelier person. And, yeah. and I listened to some pretty gnarly stuff, but it was always about, look, we're together, we're together, we're together. <laughs> be that was actually, yeah, that was part of our, our we, we, we tripped and fell into that, that, methodology or or philosophy or whatever um we made music intuitively like some of the choices we made weren't cognitive like conscious choices so like why are you screaming why are you always screaming about these things as opposed to singing sweet love songs it's like well we just like this music like it was it was intuitive and then once we got out there into the world and people were excited about the songs and we were having bigger and bigger shows and it went from a hundred people to a thousand people. We realized that the song screaming, shut up or whatever you put it out there into the world and it acts as a magnet and it draws in people who feel that way. And all of a sudden you get all of these people together in a room who feel like gravitate they gravitate towards that emotional expression that shut up i'm right. so angry i'm just i'm trying to say something and nobody's listening to me i'm so mad and then we get together and all of a sudden that negative energy comes out and there's a catharsis so it was it was really interesting that like for us we were like wow it, this the the messaging feels negative like if you just read the words on paper, there's a lot of negativity there. Mm -hmm. And yet the band is really positive. So how do we, re how do we reconcile that? And it ended up being the culture of the band was a really positive culture. And once people came in the door, you know, having heard, having related to in the end, doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. And then they come in and they're like, Oh, this is about taking that emotion and feeling like I'm not alone. This is like, I felt so depressed and now I'm showing up and there's like 35,000 people here who feel mm -hmm. that way I feel and I can't possibly be alone. And that's a good feeling. Yeah. I also think that on a, on a, on a, you know, wider view Buddhist version, you're right. In the end, it doesn't even matter. So it really does sell there's the a positive idea. Spin. Um, Speaking of memes, those in doesn't even matter. Memes are the best. Um, have you, I'm sure you've been sent a whole bunch of them. I was thinking about a, the history of like, like with, in the context of the hybrid theory release. So like I said, when it came out, there really wasn't like YouTube yet. YouTube wasn't really popular. Mm -hmm. And we've had so many iterations of so many different types of memes about the band. Um, it doesn't really matter. Ones are amazing, but people, for some, I think of like one of my favorite things, and it wasn't like, a, it's not like a, like a one liner meme, but in the beginning they used to do, there are thousands and thousands of videos of our music to anime. Yeah. Like people used to do these long form, like anime edits with our songs. And those weren't, it was like a different version of a meme. Like back then, that's what it, that's what would be shareable. It wasn't as like. That's so cool to see that though, to know that, that <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, anime is such a powerful um, medium for people, such a powerful um, uh, part of the catalog for kids who love that and adults. It must be yeah, really it cool was just like to see very, that. I mean, I don't know. I think I just say that because viral there's always been versions of viral and like i mean i i i recently ca caught like some people passing around like different edits on tiktok and i love i love the fact that a 13 year old today is just 
experiencing these things for the first time and then they're like older their parent or their older brother or cousin or something is like yo like that you like that like there's a whole bunch of music in there that you should check out and they can and and it all that whole conversation can start by them like catching a dance on tiktok or something you know what I'm saying? I'm really late. I've been intending to read Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, for a, since I heard about it. And I hadn't gotten around to it. I followed him on Twitter and I watched his Twitter 
and um, I'm finally doing the audio book for that. Mm-hmm. Here's some people. I'll, let me say, let me, let me frame it differently rather than saying like my heroes. If I was to say, here are some people you should follow on social media. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say, follow Liz Beecroft, follow Bobby hundreds and follow Patrice colors. Mm-hmm. I like those Bobby hundreds, a legend too. I mean, like. I was just I was just texting with Bobby this morning about music stuff, and he he is like, what I love about Bob is that he's just a he's such a down to earth dude, and he is uh, he obsessively listens to people. Mm-hmm. He can't stop having conversations and asking questions and listening. He would be an incredible journalist, but I feel like that would. Um, almost like like constrain his greatness too much mm-hmm. because he needs to be everywhere at, like on, on 10 different platforms at once doing crazy things in order to just exist as a creative person so yeah he's I mean you will not be you will not be disappointed if you if you follow Bobby no I feel you um, congrats on everything man congrats on this record I appreciate your time nice to see you again appreciate it man thank you so much It was great having Mike Shinoda on. If you want to catch the full interview in its entirety, check out our show page on Apple Music. What a pleasure to have Mike Chinoda on the show today to sit and talk with him. If you missed it or join us partway through, you can check it out by on demand, going to our Strombo show page, and you can find that 